today's message, today's theme out of John 8 is this idea of who Jesus is. And I entitled today's message, Everything You Need. Who is Jesus? Well, simply put, we could just stop the sermon right here. Who is Jesus? Jesus is everything you need, right? Um, but I'm going to explain that a little bit more. Here's why. It's, I'm in the middle of doing some, uh, I'm doing a wedding for a lovely couple in uh, October uh, at um, the Ringling. And, uh, you know, one of the things Mindy and I love to do is counsel um Council, you know, engaged couples as they get ready for their wedding. And we've been doing that with this couple now for, for a few months. We're getting ready to have our, our second to last counseling session next week. Um, and one of the things I love to emphasize with married couples is this. If you're looking for your spouse that you're about to marry to complete you, fulfill you, or make you happy, you should probably second guess whether this is a step that you want to take right now. Because there's no way that an individual can make a person complete or happy or fulfilled. Why? Because when we enter into a marriage or any relationship, what are you doing? You're bringing two sinful entities into that. There's always going to be disappointment and confusion, frustration, um, and eventually, you know, the uh, the lovey-dovey stuff, maybe you married couples of 46 years can relate to this. Some of that stuff that was there the first six months you were dating, it starts to disappear, you know? You realize, like, hey, life actually does consist of replacing the toilet paper roll <laughs> and picking wet towels up off the floor. And sometimes picking your spouse's wet towel up off the floor and not grumbling about it. This is, this is what God does. He brings us into relationship with other people, and he uses those sinful relationships to make us holy like Jesus is. So here's what scares me, and I communicate this to young, soon-to-be-married couples and young couples that I counsel. It's a scary exercise to look around and see kind of uh, in which direction human beings tend to run in order to find fulfillment in order to find their needs met. You go back to the book of Genesis, um, you know, oftentimes girls or women will find themselves looking to men for their fulfillment, sadly. Uh, oftentimes men will look to position or career or title into, for validating themselves and finding fulfillment and contentment. Oftentimes, athletes will look to victories or statistics or rankings in order to validate themselves and find fulfillment. Sometimes even individuals like us at certain times of the year when our sports teams are playing, or maybe when they're not playing, sadly, we will look to our sports teams to find our fulfillment. Right? Like, it's like a knee-jerk reaction. If, uh, if, if somebody comes up to my wife, and you can test her on this. Like, if somebody comes up to my wife and says, well, Tide, she will, she'll give you the ugliest glare in the world. And she will turn, and with everything in her being, she will say, war eagle. Because she's an Auburn Tiger. She wants nothing to do with the Alabama Crimson Tide. If somebody from Ohio State or from Michigan comes up to me like George did the other day with a t-shirt on and said Michigan. I asked him to take it off. I said, people, people don't appreciate that kind of satanic clothing in the house of God. I said to George, I said, we are. I'm just joking, but you get it. Like during seasons, you know, our sports teams become our identity. Sadly, even Humanity in general, I fear, is moving in a direction where they're looking to government to be their answer, to be their fulfillment. And on and on and on we can go. And yet, over and over and over again, the scriptures declare for us in the Old Testament and the New Testament where our real needs are met. And I'm going to share that with you now. John chapter 8. 
beginning in verse 31. Remember, Jesus is, is in Jerusalem here, and he's, he's getting in a bit of a spat with the only people that he really ever spat with, the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders. Verse 31, Jesus therefore said to those Jews who had believed him, if you remain in my word, then you are truly my disciples. You will know the truth. We all know this verse, by the way. This is our church verse, is it not? You will know the truth, and the truth will make you what? free. They answered him, we are Abraham's offspring and have never been in bondage to anyone. How do you say we'll be made free? Jesus answered them, most certainly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is the bondservant of sin. A bondservant doesn't live in the house forever. A son remains forever. If, if therefore the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you're Abraham's offspring, yet you will seek to kill me, because my word finds no place in you. I say the things which I have seen with my father, and you also do the things which you have seen with your father. And they answered him, Our father is Abraham. And Jesus said to them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me. A man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God, Abraham didn't do this. You do the works of your father. And they said to him, We were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, God. Therefore Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I came out and have come from God, for I haven't come of myself, but he sent me. Why don't you understand my speech? Because you can't hear my word. You are of your father the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. Gosh, he just really is interested in picking a fight here, isn't he? He was a murderer from the beginning and doesn't stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks on his own, for he's a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell the truth, you don't believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears the words of God. For this cause you don't hear because you are not of God. Yikes. Definitely not butterflies and rainbows, Jesus, here. He is having a very honest and pointed conversation with people who don't like him at all. But yet he begins to share something with those who are listening, and those, honestly, who are not listening to him. And it's this reality that in Christ, we have everything that we need. And I want to share with you this morning what those things are. I think the first thing Jesus says here for us, gang, is this. In Jesus Christ, we have freedom. In Jesus Christ, we have freedom. And I want to unpack that a little bit. He's very clear to say that um, if the Son sets you free, that you are free indeed. I love that verse. But it begs the question, and the Jews were asking this, because they thought that they were no longer in bondage anymore. They had been set free by Moses, right? So they're thinking to themselves, dude, you're crazy. What are, we, what are we free from? You're telling us we're free. We're already free people. No, Jesus says there's a hidden slave master that's holding every person bondage. That slave master has a name, and that name is sin. If we're set free in Christ, what he's really setting us free from is sin and all the accoutrements and the fabrications and the lies and the identity and the whispers of the evil one that go along with that. Jesus Christ has come and he set us free. As the primary of his text here, Jesus says we're free from sin, but I want to examine another writer here sharing the words of God, which is Paul in the sixth chapter of Romans. Paul clarifies this. He parses this idea down even more, and he says this in verse 20. For when, when, he's talking to believers here, and he's saying there was a point in time when you were and you're no more, but when you were slaves of sin. You were free in regard to righteousness. 
But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now you've been set free from sin and have become slaves of God. The fruit you get leads to sanctification, and its end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Never were more important words probably spoken in the epistles than when Paul says, who you were before Christ was a slave to sin. And the righteousness of God, the law of the Old Testament, held us account to that. We were slaves to that which we could never fix in and of ourselves. You were in stockade. You were in bondage. You were, you were sealed in a tomb of death. And he says, Paul says, and what you deserve as a human being, the wages that you deserve to be paid is death. You deserve it before Christ. Every single person who comes into this world. It's a hard truth, gang. But, but it's, it's what, what Jesus, Jesus is teaching. teaching. It's, it's what everybody out there is living and may not even realize. And, and it's something that most of you probably realized at some point in time in your life. Who I was before Jesus was a slave to sin, worthy of nothing more than death. I did not deserve a relationship with God. I did not deserve God's love. I did not deserve any kind of forgiveness on, beha on, on God's behalf. I was, I was dead in my sin. And then he says this, these beautiful words, but now, now, what's now? Now, now is post-conversion. Now is post-commitment to Christ. Now is post-born again. Now is new creation in Christ. Paul says, now, now you've been set free from sin and you've become slaves to God. Now, some people may be uncomfortable with that idea as well. You may say to yourself, oh, I'm not going to be a slave to anybody. Nobody's going to be my master. I'm sharing with you personal experience. The moment Jesus Christ became my Savior and my Lord, the moment Jesus Christ became my master, and I became a slave to Him, my life changed forever. And it got amazing. Don't be afraid of being a slave to God because when you're a slave to God, then you really know what freedom is. Well, in such a way with words. Um, so much of what Jesus says later in this text in John chapter 8 details what freedom from sin really means. Freedom from sin can mean a, a lot of freedom, practically speaking, in our lives. Freedom from sin means that you have freedom from the cultural requirements of this day and age that we live in. And you have freedom from the religious requirements of this day that we live in. I was just reading in my quiet time this morning in, in the book of Romans, and Paul was detailing for the, the followers in Jesus as a reminder to them that, you know, it's not about what you eat or don't eat anymore. It's not about what you drink or don't drink anymore. We're free in Christ in these things. Now, we're not to be a stumbling block to other people. If somebody struggles in a particular area, if, if they can't worship God because you're sitting there eating a bag of Funyuns, then put the Funyuns away, right? And that's a funny example. But back in those days... People, believers felt so free in Christ that even if fruit meat was being sold in the marketplace that had been offered to idols, believers were like, well, we're not putting good meat to waste, right? And everything's been made clean in Jesus Christ. Let's eat. They would pray over it, and they would ask God to bless it, and they would eat it, and they would enjoy it. But there were still some people that were struggling with that. So they wouldn't go out and buy the meat and eat it around those people because they didn't want to offend. But they were free, and they knew it, free from the religious requirements. Here's another important thing that we're free from with regard to sin, and I, I think this is so important for everybody in the room to hear. 
you are free from any of the words that the evil one, the devil himself, speaks over you or whispers in your ear. You are free from those lies now and forever. If he tells you that you are not valuable to God anymore because of something you did in your past, tell him, I've been remade by the blood of Christ and I'm free. If he tells you that uh, because of somebody that you have in your life right now that's booing you, because that person is booing you or they're scaring you, that you're invaluable and have no purpose in God, tell them, my identity isn't in them, my identity is in him and him alone. Whatever it is that the evil one is telling you, Jesus told us to know one thing for sure. It's a lie. It's a lie. It may be a carefully crafted one, but it's a lie. And the most important thing we have freedom from, according to Jesus and according to Paul, is this. You have freedom from eternal death. Everybody's going to spend an eternity somewhere. The question is, what's the zip code? I know and am secure in the fact that if I were to fall over in a heap here this morning, my next destination is eternal life in heaven with him. But yet Paul said the wages of sin is death. What, what death is he talking about? He's talking eternal death, spiritual death, hell. Yet Christ came and set us free from that. You can live with that assurance. So the first thing here in Jesus Christ, we have freedom. But the second thing we have in Christ is this, point two, in Jesus Christ, I love this, we have family. We have family. I mean, yes, we're enjoying the fruits of that a little bit this morning. Jesus makes this curious statement. He says this, and, and you can read it quickly and it can be lost on you, but let me, let me drive down on it a little bit here. Jesus says this, the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. You know what affirmation Jesus made with that statement right there? This is what he's saying. To understand it, we first have to understand Abraham. But at the root, what Jesus is saying is this. He's saying, when you're dead and in your sin, uh, you are living according to death, and you have no eternal family in heaven. When you surrender your life to Christ, you are adopted by God himself, and you are made a son. Scripture tells us that we all become sons and daughters. We become heirs of who God is. You know what an heir gets to do, right? Heir gets to inherit everything that belongs to the Father. That's a cool promise that we sell ourselves short on. But he, he says this. He uses his slave language again. He says that the slave does not remain in the house forever, but the son remains forever. What, what, is, he, what is he talking about? To understand what Jesus is saying here, he's speaking the language of the Jews. He's speaking the language of the Pharisees. He's relating the story of Abraham, Isaac, and Ishmael. And if you don't remember that story, know that Abraham had two boys. He had two sons. In his older years, Abraham and his wife Sarah, they could not have children. She grew to an old age. Her, her womb was barren. They thought their years were done. Abraham surrenders his life to the Lord, follows the Lord's leading, and God makes a promise to Abraham. He says, oh, you will have a son. I'll give you a son. So funny, so old are they, and so funny is this idea that Sarah even laughs out loud at God. And uh, God hears her and says, why are you laughing? Like, you don't believe I can do this? Watch me. But while they're waiting, because sometimes God makes promises in our life, and then we, he does this really, like, difficult thing. He makes us wait. You know? This isn't a God's drive through right, where God makes a promise, and he can pull around to the side, and he hands it out a window. Sometimes God's promises take forever. Sometimes they take a lifetime. Sometimes God's promises won't even be fulfilled in your lifetime. Sometimes it may be your great-grandchildren that experiences the promises. But with that said, God had promised Abraham a son. The son did not come right away. So Abraham and his wife Sarah decided to take matters into their own hands. 
and they had uh, Abraham went and slept with a slave girl. And they got Ishmael. And it, this friction created, started. And then this son of promise eventually comes along in the form of Isaac. So there's a son who was born of promise and faith, and there's a son who was born of stubbornness and uh, deceit. That brings us to Genesis 21. And the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. Isaac is the child of faith and promise. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, laughing. So she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not err with my son Isaac. And the thing that the thi and this thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, Be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For through Isaac, your offspring be named. So there was that which Abraham took in his own hands and birthed out of deceit. And there's that which God promised and delivered based upon Abraham's faith. What Jesus is saying here, all this, what Jesus is saying is this. You become a child of God's family by being born of faith, not works. You're born of simply trusting in him. You are brought into the family of God simply because of the faith and promise that Jesus Christ delivered to us on the cross. It's not the kind of situation where you can get into heaven because you manipulate your circumstances in church life or you make, manipulate your circumstances in your home life and you work really hard to try and please God. You work really hard to try and look like a righteous person. That's not why we get into heaven. We get into heaven because we are children of promise. God said that whoever believes on me will not perish but have everlasting life. Just express the faith, and God draws you in to his family. In Isaac, he was the son of God's promise, and in him we see the identity and continuance of God's family. See, here's the other rub with the Pharisees. The Jews thought they were part of God's family due to genetics. They thought because physically, they could trace their lineage to Abraham, that that made them right in the eyes of God. Most of us in this room are living proof that that's not what makes you right with God. I, I don't know. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I would assume that most of us in this room here are not of Jewish lineage. We can't trace any DNA to Abraham. My wife has a little. I have none. We both came to Jesus Christ the same way, by faith. You're a family not because of what you do, but because of your faith in what Jesus Christ has already done. Listen to the contrast here of slavery versus family. Paul talks about it in Romans 8. For you, he says to the church, to the believers, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Now, take, take time out there. Maybe you've heard this, maybe you haven't. You know what the word Abba means, right? It mean, you, you, probably most of you, you had an earthly father, and um, when you were little, little, you, you didn't continually call him father. You didn't say, Father, can I have some dinner? Father, can I go with you to work? Father, will you drop me off at school? What was the term you probably used? Dad or daddy. The most intimate version of father is Abba. So what Paul is saying here is you're adopted as sons and daughters. And now you have the privilege to not just call him father, but to call him daddy. You get this image of, 
of crawling up in the lap of somebody that you call daddy, somebody who you run to, somebody who loves you no matter what, somebody who's always anxious to throw their arms around you. Abba, daddy. Verse 16. Verse 16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him, in order that we may also be glorified with him. This is great stuff. This, 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 these, these, this language that Jesus is using today is just heaped with promise. We're not slaves. We're family. The third thing that we have in Christ is this. So we have freedom, we have family, and now in Jesus Christ we know that we have truth. Truth. So many things in the world buy for our allegiance to truth. It's a 24-hour news cycle. It's a social media extravaganza. Everybody's got to stinking opinion about something. Everybody is right. Nobody's wrong. It's irritating, to say the least. People, they pledge their allegiance to one news agency over another because one's true and one's not. They, they, pledge, their, they pledge their allegiance to one particular holy book over another. They pledge their allegiance to one form of education over another. They pledge their allegiance to one political party over another. I got news for you. <laughs> news agencies, political parties, uh, you know, the Elks and Rotary Club, I don't care where you pledge your allegiance, they're all full of messed up sinful people. And they're not going to give you the truth. They'll give you a shaded version of the truth. They'll give you a biased version of the truth. And they won't give you a truth, a truth that you can stake your life on, like Christ does. But we see here that Jesus is the locus of truth. He's the very central being. He's the source of, of truth. We're told as much in Paul's words in Ephesians 4. Verses 20 to 24, Paul says this, But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in what? Who? The truth. I want you to just drill that, that idea into your brain here, gang. The truth is in Jesus. The truth isn't in Fox News. The truth isn't in CNN. The truth isn't in a political party. The truth isn't in our form of government. The truth isn't even in the Constitution of the United States. The truth is in a person. That person has a name, and he's the Son of God, Jesus Christ. If you're going to stake your life on anything, I'm so blessed and happy we live in this country. I'm so thankful we have a Constitution. I'm so thankful that we have people who serve in political life. God love them. Um, but... Any decision that comes down through my family has to filter through the truth of Jesus Christ and that alone in his word. So, as the truth is in Jesus, verse 22, he goes on to tell them, So put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds. And to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Paul's saying, there's truth. That truth is Jesus Christ. Take up the old stuff, put on the new stuff that looks like him, and live for that. Live for that. Compared to the darkened minds and hearts of others, always remember that Jesus is truth. And take his word for it. He said, in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Talk about an exclusionary statement. You can't get to heaven by being nice. You can't get to heaven by being unified. You can't get to heaven by doing good things. The only way you get to heaven is by trusting in the name of God's Son, Jesus Christ. And if you're sitting here today and you're thinking, I've heard this a million times, you can't hear it enough. You're going to hear it every single week. Every week we're going to, you're going to hear it. You can only be saved in Jesus. Today is your day to be saved. Truth isn't what we make it either, gang. 
Truth isn't your version of the Bible. Truth isn't your version of Jesus. Truth isn't your version of religion. Truth isn't your version of politics. Truth isn't what anybody spouts on social media or on a news channel. Truth is God's word rightly divided according to Jesus Christ. That's why I keep out here a lot. I think my friend Didier does too. When you teach and preach, you have to be in this all the time. Because if I'm not, what I'm doing is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to glance at it and then I'm going to me- make some sort of warped reality of truth. Not what God says. Truth is what we make. It's not what we make it. It's not relative. It doesn't shift according to the times. The truth of Jesus Christ is not dumber now because we think we're smarter 2,000 years after he lived. If anything, we're proving ourselves dumber 2,000 years later. How is the world better, and I'm talking morally, how is the world better 2,000 years after Christ when we try and fix ourselves and push him into a corner? It's not. It's not. Truth isn't made up by by blogs. Truth isn't given to us based upon science. Anything that stands in contrast to Jesus and his word is not truth. We can try and rationalize it. You can try and justify it to make yourself feel better in it. You can even try and saute it if you want. You're not going to get to a place where any truth outside of Jesus is true. If it stands opposed to Christ, it's not truth. And sadly, we've created this dichotomy in the world today. In in our lives, we've created a dichotomy. And I, I feel like, in some respects, we're teaching our young children this. We're teaching them this false dichotomy that there's scientific truth and then there's faith. We say that. And, and they stand against each other. We're teaching our children that there's scientific truth and then there's faith. There's Jesus' truth, which stands over science and faith. This spring I read a book. Uh, um, so I always try and stay one step ahead of my children, and then I do. I love to read and I love to learn. But um, my son was going to take his first uh, philosophy of religion class in college. And, uh, you know, that's always a, you know, real like, ooh, what, <laughs> what's going to come out of that at the, at the University of Florida? And I'm thinking to myself, boy, this could go sketchy real fast. We could, we could go sideways. So, uh, so I, I, I gave him a reading list. I say, your professor's going to give you a reading list. I want you, and, and I looked at his reading list in detail, and there was some good stuff on there. And, uh, and then I gave him my own reading list, and I said, I want you to read these two books. And he did. He read them. Um, but then I started reading more and more. And one of the books I read was a book called Can Science Explain Everything? And it was by a man named Dr. John Lennox. He's an esteemed mathematics professor at uh, Oxford University, uh, an amazing Christian philosopher and apologist. Uh, Gene, you're nodding your head. Are you you familiar with John Lennox? Ah, I'm jealous. (laughs) And so he was basically... uh, in reading this, one of the questions that came, this book kept coming to my mind, and, and, and he was trying to deal with this issue of, would he say that scientific laws prove faith, or do they stand in contrast to faith? And this is what he had to say about it. Bear with me. I just want to read you a, a paragraph here. He said, the truth is that the laws of nature describe the universe but they actually explain nothing. They describe the universe, but they explain nothing. We pause to reflect that from the perspective of science, the very existence of laws of nature is a mystery in and of itself. Richard Feynman, a Nobel laureate in physics, said that the fact that there are rules at all to be checked is kind of a miracle. That it is possible to find a rule, like the inverse square law of gravitation, And when you find that law, it's some sort of miracle. It is not understood at all, but it leads to the possibility of prediction. It means it tells you 
what you would expect to happen in an experiment you've not yet done. Lennox goes on to say, the very fact that those laws can be mathematically formulated was for Albert Einstein a constant source of amazement and pointed people beyond the physical universe to some, quote, according to Einstein, spirit vastly superior to that of man. So to put it in a little simpler terms, what Lennox is saying here and what Einstein is affirming is this. When you drop something out of an airplane, if there were no friction of air, if you've taken physics at any time, you may remember that uh, the rate of acceleration is constant on um, something due to gravity, 9.6 meters per second squared. We know that. That's a law. But the fact that there is that law points us to the fact that there is a law giver. There's someone who created this universe that we live in that is orderly and concise, that we can predict when uh, rain is going to come, that we can predict that, you know, if a, uh, I can remember as a boy, the first time I watched a major league pitcher throw a curveball in person, dumbfounded. As a high school pitcher, I used to always try and ascribe to, to throw a curveball like that and could never do it. Which, which is, is why, why my high school to coach, coach told me college, college probably isn't in the cards for you. Um, so, so the rate of spin is directly related to the break of a baseball. Of a baseball. Why? Because, because of the flow of air over one side of the ball. Same reason an airplane lifts up off the ground, right? So when you spin that ball that hard, it's going to tumble through the air. The air rate is going to be different over one side of the ball versus the other. It's going to drop or it's going to turn. These are predictable things. The fact that we can predict these things tells us that there's one who gives truth above the scientific world. Jesus says some very pointed things here about truth. Thank you for letting me geek out about science, by the way. Jesus says some pointed things here about truth. He says this, Truth is known by abiding in his word. Jesus said that to the Pharisees. He said, Truth is known by abiding in his word. The scriptures which Christ authored is his word. The gospel accounts which testify to him, that's his word. If you want to know the truth, abide in his word. Abide is a fancy word for remain or camp out in his word. You want to know more about Jesus? You want to know more about his truth? Your primary destination needs to be here. Camp out here. He tells the Jews this. He says, one, you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. That's brutally honest. He said, the reason you don't believe me, the reason you want to kill me, is because my word of truth is not finding residence in you. The word he uses here uh, is koleo. It's the Greek word which means you've not granted admittance to my word. You've kept my word out. And he says the second thing to them, you seek to kill me because I, the Christ, speak that truth. Here it's also important how Christ's words correlate to what God affirms through the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 2. Look at Paul's words, beginning in verse 14. He says, the natural person, that's being a person apart from Christ, a person in their sin. He says, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they're folly to him. Do you know people who look to Jesus right now and look to God's word and they, they just see it as a joke, the folly? That's because that's what they do. And he is not able to understand them because they're spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who understands the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So when you come to Jesus, God does a brain transplant, and he does a heart transplant. And he takes the truth of his word, and he puts it in you, and he administers it through his Holy Spirit. Things that I understand now as a younger man when I was opposed to Christ amaze me simply because by faith I've accepted God's truth. So truth is known by abiding in his word. And then the second thing Jesus here is, says is this, truth in and of itself is free. So we know that in Jesus we have free freedom, but the more you know the truth itself, that truth is freeing. Our sinful minds and hearts 
default to this notion that whatever God has for us is restrictive. If God has something for us, it's going to mean that we're going to have to lose something. It's going to look like punishment. It's going to be distasteful. And I'm telling you, it's the exact opposite, actually. The person who surrenders to the truth of Christ and his word finds that actually that truth is free. Jesus has given us so many wonderful teachings that remind us that in our new identity in him, we're no longer slaves to what other people say about us. We're no longer slaves to who we once were. Bury yourself in God's truth and find freedom. Let me read the last part of this text as I bring us home in point four. There's a lot in John's gospel, so bear with me here. John 8, 48. Then the Jews answered him, Don't we say well that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? <laughs> and Jesus answered, I don't have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. But I don't seek my own glory. There's one who seeks and judges. Most certainly I tell you, if a person keeps my word, he will never see death. Then the Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets. And you say, If a man keeps my word, he'll never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died? The prophets died. Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say that he is our God. You have not known him, but I know him. If I said I do not know him, I would be like you, a liar. But I know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. The Jews therefore said to him, You're not fit yet fifty years old. Have you seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, Most certainly I tell you, before Abraham came into existence, I am. Therefore they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, having gone through the middle of them, and so passed by. So this is our, this is our high climax here, obviously. And this brings us to our last truth. In Jesus Christ, we have eternal life. Point four. In Jesus Christ, we have eternal life. In this one simple statement, Jesus says that those who keep his word will not taste death. Um, those who keep his word. The word keep here is from the Greek word teros. It means guarding or protecting from loss, right? So it's like, it's like you become a, a safe or a vault for God's word. Clinging to it as if it's your own. Clinging to God's word as if it is your very life. And that's what gives us eternal life. But what is this word that we cling to? One last verse this morning in Romans 5. You probably feel like we're doing a study in the book of Romans this morning. But what are you going to do? Verse 20, now the law came in to increase the trespass. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So, Paul's saying here, you know, when you lived your life under the law, the Ten Commandments, all you were going to find out about yourself was that you can't keep the law. And you're going to feel more and more like a slave to the bad things that you do. But then all of a sudden, grace is heaped upon us through Jesus Christ. So as a recognition of our sin grew, Jesus heaped more grace upon us than our sin could count. And we became free so that we might not taste death, but have eternal life. Grace abounds all the more. One last thought in closing around the way this conversation ends. Maybe for me, one of my favorite parts in the Gospel of John. It's quite a, cli quite a climactic statement we've heard over the last few weeks, right? The procession of water and Jesus cries out, I am living water. 
the, the demonstration of light on the last night of the tabernacle. Everybody lights those candelabras in the temple courtyard of the women, and Jesus cries out, I am the light of the world. The Jews say, how can you know Abraham? You're not even 50 years old. And Jesus says, because before Abraham was, I am. Do you know why you're going to live an eternal life? Because you've surrendered your life to the eternal God. I am is one of the most marvelous statements in all of the Old Testament and the New Testament. You may remember it from Moses' interaction with God on Sinai. And he said, when he goes to the Jews, who, what name do I give them? Who do I tell them sent me? And God said, tell them I am. I am. What does that mean? The fancy word here is the tetragrammaton. It, it's the name of God that's given for himself. You can't give God a name. I can't give God a name. Only God can name himself. And the name he chose for himself is Yahweh. It is I am. It is Jehovah. The statement of I am that Jesus makes is earth shattering. This statement before Abraham was I am, it like, no wonder the Jews picked up stones. I mean, like, this took everything that they had been clinging to, everything in their world that was sacred, and Jesus had just turned their whole life over, upside down. This Jewish carpenter from Nazareth, son of a single mother who hung out with sinners and tax collectors in Galilee, is the eternal God who gave Abraham his name. Remember, Abram had his name changed to Abraham, and Jesus was the one who gave it to him. This statement claims absolute deity. This statement claims absolute equality with the Father. This statement claims eternality, meaning forever. This statement claims absolute sovereignty and power over everything that ever was, is, or will be. This statement claims complete authority over sinners and over sin. This statement, I am, claims complete authority over every religious leader in every cult and pulpit in America today. This statement, I am, claims absolute authority over every Jew, every Gentile, every Christian, every Muslim, every Buddhist, every person who rejects Christ does not does not change the fact that he is Lord over all. I am means that he claims total authority over every political leader and every government that stands on the face of the earth. He claims complete authority over every truth and false truth and every idea that ever was or will be. Everything that has ever been created and grown from the womb to the ground to the sky and to the earth is his and his alone. When he says, I am, he's saying there's nothing that exists that wasn't before me. He's saying there's nothing that exists now that isn't for me. When he says that the I am, the I am, what Jesus is saying is that everything in the Face of the earth for all of eternity is mine and mine alone. Now, let me bring it home for you, gang. Why does that matter? If you're here and you know Jesus Christ, you are His forever. If you are here and you do not know Jesus Christ, He wants you as His forever. He created you that you might have a relationship with Him and that you might spend eternity with Him, worshiping Him, enjoying the pleasure of His inheritance forever and ever. This, Jesus, offers all these things to us for free. No inflation. It is free. Zero inflation. And when you get this, you don't get over this. If you can tell from me, I did not get over it. And I, I want you to have that. So if you're hearing this morning that your identity belongs to another person, or you're hearing this morning that your identity belongs to a boss, or that your identity belongs to a career, or a team, or a church, or whatever, 
I'm here to tell you that the great I am says, no, you belong to me and me alone. If you need to be set free in his truth, I want today to be that day. It's as simple as this. Lord, I trust you. I believe Jesus is God's son. I believe he died on the cross for me. I believe he took my sins. And I want to live forever in heaven with him. And what God says is, if that's what you believe in your heart, then it's true. Because my word says it's true. If you confess with your sins that Jesus is Lord, you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that then you will be saved. That's the words of the Apostle Paul. Have you done it? I'm going to pray and I'm going to invite you to do it. And then maybe another group of you here. I know we're a little smaller in number this morning, and that's cool. But there may be a group of people here. You know, when you're invited to Christ, you're invited into family. And maybe you're kind of walking on the edges of this family, and now's the time where you need to covenant. Covenant, meaning you need to connect and, and commit yourself to this body of people. God didn't design us to walk alone. He designed us to walk with family, right? If you need to make this family your family, I want to invite you to come and talk to me after the service. Because this family, if you've not joined this church, this family would love to have you. And they're good people. They're good people. So I'm going to close in prayer. If you need to receive Christ, I'm going to invite you to do that. If you need to join and connect with this body, I'm going to invite you to do that. Let's pray.